Alrighty, what's up everybody? My name's Chance, and today's our 11th episode in the FNM podcast, and we're going to be diving into some spicy-ass Zendikar Rising spoilers today, and with me as always, we have Hello Good Game. Hey guys, how are you doing today? And MTG Jeff, I think he's got some, some family stuff, some dad stuff going on, so taking a little bit of a breather this week, but that's fine, he'll be back with us next week. So, HGG, uh, we've been talking about these spoilers. We're both very excited, and uh, we've only briefly looked through them. Are you excited to see what Zendikar is, is rising for us? Um, you know, today is, what, Tuesday? So we just had uh, the uh, press release event, whatever you want to call it, uh, where they release, you know, the cinematic trailer, and then they start the spoiler season, um, which is great. And uh, so this is going to be the first that, uh, you know, Dr. Spilken and myself have had a chance to look at these cards. Um, so it's going to be completely uh, off the top, off the cuff, whatever you want to say there. Um, but first thoughts is cooler than I thought. Um, and we had a couple new mechanics talked about, the uh, party mechanic. So if you have um, more creatures of a certain type, I think it was rogue, wizard, cleric. And uh, what was the fourth one? Rogue, wizard, cleric, warrior. Warrior. Perfect. So if you have, um, you know, a partial party or a, a full party, there's different cards within the set that are going to utilize, um, you know, having those specific members out on the field. This really brings me back to, like, uh, kind of a, an RPG MMO feel, right, where you've got your party, like you've got a tank, a healer, some DPS, right? Um, and they all have their different roles. So... I think that's really cool um and you know we did i know we're talking about zendikar today but we had um the next year of magic uh kind of outlined for us uh to where we're going and at a certain point uh, you guys are gonna have to look this up for yourself we'll get to it in a different show um you know, we've got a, a link up between dungeons and dragons and magic the gathering so you know this uh kind of feels like it's setting um uh, you know the mood for that getting your your adventure parties ready um slay some dragons hopefully eventually so uh, yeah, we've got it must be 40 or 60 cards to get through today, so quite a bit. We're probably going to hit them pretty quick, and then, you know, once we do finish all of the spoilers up, uh, you know, within the next week or two, we'll come back, we'll overview them all, we'll talk about, uh, you know, our favorites, things that we think are sleepers, you know, trash cards, uh, just to get you guys the general overview so you're prepared and ready to uh, rise Zendikar with us. Yeah, so... Without further ado, let's dive into these cards. So the first one we have is Jace Mirror Mage. Three mana for a four loyalty planeswalker that does have the kicker ability. Kicker is coming back, everybody. So it reads, when Jace Mirror Mage enters the battlefield, if Jace was kicked, create a token that's a copy of Jace. It's not a legendary, and its starting loyalty is one. And then his abilities are plus one loyalty, and you get to scry two. And then for zero, you can draw a card and reveal it and remove a number of loyalty counters equal to that card's converted mana cost from Jace Mirror Mage. So, uh, interesting with the whole kicker onto a Planeswalker. I'm, I'm excited to see that mechanic. Uh, and this isn't really my style, y'all know. This is very controlling. Like, I'm gonna see and set myself up. So it's not exactly exciting on the front face of it all. And I don't think it'll be that exciting in play either. But that's just me hoping that control doesn't come back and smack everybody around, right? So what do you think, HGG? Well, I mean, so coming full circle, we did last uh, spoilers together on the podcast here. And um, I can't think of its name right now, but uh, Behemoth, the big old, um, you know, whenever it interacts, you gain three life, draw a card, yeah. make a 3-3 three, three beast. His name, it's gonna drive me nuts if I don't think of it. Uh, yeah, now you got Gargaroth. me lost on it. Elder Gargaroth, okay, there you go. Uh, not the behemoth. Um, but anyways, uh, when this card came up in spoilers last set, I was like, you know what, this card's trash, it has no enter the battlefield effects, it's gonna get removed immediately, it costs like five, it's expensive. It's a good card, it's been rampant everywhere. Um, I like it quite a bit, and if you can play that sucker with flash instant speed, uh, you're winning games so. I'm going to try to be a little bit more conservative uh, with the spoilers this set. And my snap decision is to say that I don't like this, Jace, right? It doesn't say you win the game on it. <laughs> but uh, we talked about the kicking for five, right? Um, and I think that's good. 
to have two copies come out, um, you know, it's forcing multiple uh, removal spells of some sort, uh, unless there's, you know, deal damage to each planeswalker or something. But I think that's great because you're getting uh, two bodies that each will now warrant removal. So uh, your card advantage is high. Um, however, I think, you know, casting it for three could happen. But what might need to happen instead is, you know, um, counter magic on the back end. This might not get played really early, potentially. This could get played, you know, that turn five, turn six, maybe not even kicked, right? Just so they can protect it. Um, so I'm really interested, I guess I should say, as to where this card goes. Yeah. Initially, I think it's not the greatest, but I, there's going to be potential somewhere. Yeah, I think it'll be, and I'm not saying this all along the same lines because everyone will shoot me, but I think it'll be along the lines of Narset where you just sort of play one or two copies. Now, Narset did a lot more because it shut down card draw and all this and that, but I, I see it being a, a sort of flavor card in a lot of blue decks, not necessarily the main combo piece. Mm -hmm. So next up, we have uh, Nari, Heir of the Ancients. This is a four drop for one red and one white mana symbols. Uh, coming in with four loyalty, a plus one ability, create a one one white core warrior creature token. You may attach an equipment you control to it. So this immediately brings it back to the party mechanic where the plus ability gives you a warrior. That's going to help fill your party. And you know your party's going to need some sick equipment to go along with them. Uh, so that could potentially help you there as well. Minus two, look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal a warrior or equipment card from among them and put it into your hand. Uh, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, you know, minus two is fine. It can do it when it enters the battlefield. Looking at the top six cards of your library is fine. Putting them into your hand is lackluster. It's not bad, right? You know, it's, it's a draw. We've seen so many powerful um, effects that are just like right into the battlefield. Um, I know, so, so Collective Company, for example, uh, is a historic card, so it's kind of not on point, but into your hand is uh, far less prevalent than into the battlefield. Um, you know, and I still think being six deep for your key card is really, really good um, and will still see play. Uh, I just don't think it's going to be one of those day one, everybody built around a deck around it and busted it, uh, similar to like Winota or something, right? Like it's not that powerful. Um, you know, it does give me a little bit more hope than Jace, uh, just for my personal play style, right? Of what I'm comfortable and can mentally stitch together. Um, so yeah, minus three. Uh, deal damage to target creature or planeswalker equal to twice the number of equipment you control. So that's pretty good. Um, you know, five equipment, twice is 10 damage. You can use her minus three as soon as she enters the battlefield, right? So if you can stack equipment and then play Nari and do the minus right away, like you probably get that chip damage in with those aggro attackers and you get some equipment on them, maybe get a little bit more damage in. You've got uh, a few equipment on the field, boom, Nari. Uh, that's where I think uh, they're really going to shine is with just immediate minus threes well one thing the the minus three is only on creatures for planeswalkers i kept rereading that line but you can't send it to face oh. so yeah <laughs> um and see now this is the thing about first time reads yeah uh, yeah you always like just, you read what you want to read right <laughs> yeah best with done with a group <laughs> Um, so another thing to mention here is Ember Cleave is a rotation proof equipment. So that's probably what a lot of the, the players playing her are going to be searching for, right? Is Ember Cleave. Uh, a few of the other ones not so good that we're going to be sticking around is, uh, I think Mace of the Valiant is one, right? And then the, the Rakdos Knight equipment, I, I forget the name of it. Uh, it's like uh, Steel Lance or something. Yeah, yeah, that one's going to be sticking around. So we, we actually don't have a whole lot of equipment uh, sticking with us through rotation, but Ember Cleave is, is probably the big one that people are going to be like, oh, I can attach a free Ember Cleave. But like you said, Nahiri's also four mana, so she takes up that exact same spot as Winota. So her her strength may be sort of overshadowed, like you said. 
by her her predecessor. So, but all all in all, I do have more hope for her than than Jace. So, <laughs> but again, like I, mean, I, I said, guess okay. minus three wiping a planeswalker at least is nice. Oh yeah, and um, I mean even if you're just playing, you know, Mesa Valiant and Ember Cleave, that's still four damage. That's that's enough to chunk most planeswalkers. You're not going to be taking down a Yugen, but yeah, good luck with that one anyways. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, oh. so <laughs> moving us on past the, the first two Planeswalkers that we got a few days early uh, and into some of the actual cards, we have Marasa Root Grazer. It's a uh, Selesnya 2-mana, two 2-3 uh, beast with Vigilance. And what I really like about this card is it interacts with a lot of the cards from the rest of the set, and you'll see that as we move on. But... You tap it, and you may put a basic land card from your hand onto the battlefield. So that's nice. You can play two lands in one turn, right? It's like a reusable grazer, which is beautiful. Furthermore, you can tap it and return target basic land you control to its owner's hand. So if you have something like Azusa or uh, the Dryad, then you can return it and still play it. So you can get that double proc effect of the lands with these landfall abilities over and over and over again, right? Which is really cool, so... I think it's nice to see a little bit of ramp outside of Simic. Right? Selesnya oh, gets yeah. its day. Um, you know what that means. It's just going to be Bant Ramp. <laughs> uh, next up, we have a, a pretty special card here. Uh, what were they called? I forget. Um, module dual-faced cards. Um, so these cards will have a land on one side, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and there will be one for each color. And then on the opposing side, there's going to be, um, you know, a spell or sorcery, a creature, let's see, uh, some sort of shenanigans. This one here, though, is uh, Valkut Stoneforge. Uh, it is uh, the red land. It enters the battlefield tapped. We can tap it to uh, add one red mana source. And then on the opposing side of the card is Valkut Awakening for three. It's an instant speed spell. Any number of cards from your hand on the bottom of your library then draw that many cards plus one. Um, so, you know, a really nice uh, cycle your hand for a red deck, get rid of those lands, find some more burn spells type scenario. Yeah, and Rael actually came to mind because my mind's always like, jank, jank, jank. So as soon as I saw that, I was like, ooh, this is more fuel for the fire. Anyways, um, I'm, I'm excited to see how these lands play out and what's the number of them we see in decks and all that. You know, whenever you have a land that has extra value, it's always interesting to see how how much value does that silly little land actually carry with it. And you'd, you'd be very surprised, right? Yeah, like it, uh, you know, it's great for the land early game so you can ride your mana curve, but it's also going to be great as a, a top deck later on and typically, it would be a land, and that's a dead turn for you, but now you get a little more gas, um, and in this case, a lot more, because you're able to uh, draw some more from your library. Yeah, super awesome. Next up, we have Shell Shield, and I had to make sure to say that one slow. <laughs> one mana instant speed with a kicker of one, and it reads target creature you control gets plus zero, plus three until end of turn. So kind of like half of what dive down in and then if this spell was kicked that creature also gains hexproof so if you pay one extra mana it's the other half so it's similar to that and i think we also have glint right now in standard which is two mana give a creature plus zero plus three and hexproof so i think this is just a little bit better version of that go away tempo blue <laughs> you don't need any more tools you know, I, I don't like seeing Tempo Blue on one hand because it's like, oh, I hate going against this. But I do like seeing it because it's something that can go up against those slower control matchups and really make them feel bad about the counters. You know what I mean? Nice. Uh, next up, we have Rune Crab, also for one. This is a 0-3 with Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent mills three cards. Woof. Uh, a mill every time you play a land plus a defender uh, it's gonna be a hard day for mono red <laughs> yeah uh not to mention the fact that we have uh wow what's his name world shaper i believe that's still in standard and now because it's in the arena booster set it'll always be in standard so and that card reads whenever it dies you return all lands from your graveyard to your battlefield 
So you're probably going to be seeing a whole lot of landfall janky decks with that. And this is one of the main ones that I'm looking at trying it out with. Stop it. All right, next up we have Blood Chief's Thirst, one mana sorcery. And this one also has a kicker, but its kicker cost is three. So probably the highest kicker we've seen so far. But this one is really, it's something that I want to say it's good, but because it's a sorcery, I'm, I'm on the fence. Anyways, destroy target creature or planeswalker with converted mana cost two or less. So you're pretty much never going to see a planeswalker with converted mana cost two or less, or at least I never have. If this spell was kicked, instead destroy target creature or planeswalker. So one mana, destroy a two CMC basically a creature, right? That's in a Johnny's Pride Mate or some shit, or Lotus Cobra, which we'll get into. And if it's kicked, four mana, you can destroy a Planeswalker or a creature, which we've seen generally around four mana will get you an exile effect on a creature or Planeswalker, right? So I think the flexibility with this one is nice, except it's a sorcery. If it was instant, I'd be like, yeah, this one's going to be played, slap a stamp on it. But I'm hesitant. What do you think? Um, You know, we do have some Planeswalkers, two or less, uh, Nissa of the Steward of the Elements just was released in Amonkhet. Um, you know, that's a two-drop Planeswalker, but like you said, they're really rare. Um, you know, that's the only one I can think of right now. I think this card shines as in limited, where, you know, your opponent gets those aggro plays in, you've got an answer for it. Late game, you've got an answer for it. It's a little expensive late game uh, as the kicker for four, potentially. It's just a destroy. Um, but think potentially um no i i almost don't even think so uh to use a destroy for four seems just like wrong it and it's too slow you, know, you should be destroying the whole field for four yeah right um again in limited i think um just because you can only have 40 cards and removal is such a high priority that uh you know this is going to act inter interact early game and late game um so i think that's really what this card was made for I, I will say this, I think it will be decent for free-to-play players if we see some, like, if this is, ends up being it for our removal in black, you know, if they're like, yep, oh, we gave you Blood Chief's Thirst, I think, you know, you could justify playing this card in your free-to-play deck somewhere. Yeah, and it's kind of like a, a less important shock, almost, like, black, um, you know, just dealing with their mana dummy or their first creature on board, um, you know, when you're on the draw and not the play is sometimes kind of nice. Uh, just kind of reset things. But like you said, sorcery speed. Yeah. <laughs> Big takeaway. Next up, we have Lotus Cobra for two. This is a creature snake, 2-1, with landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, add one mana of any color. This is a stackable ability. If you get multiple Lotus Cobras, you're adding multiple lands. Uh, you know, you playing multiple lands you're adding multiple mana this is not what people are looking for um <laughs> uh, a lot of people are upset with the amount of ramp uh, currently available and you know some of it is leaving um in weird ways right like uh risen reef comes to mind right this is kind of like an elemental based set uh we kind of get the feeling of and risen reef is an amazing ramp creature that is no longer around so it does make sense to bring a few more back into it right let's not focus on they added more ramp why would they do this right <laughs> <laughs> um like some of it is leaving and you know we have to do or we do have to replace uh those cards as best we can to not disturb the ramp players too much yeah i'm i'm really excited but again Whenever I see a new set, my first thing is always jank, jank, jank. So I don't actually see the repercussions of what happens until three weeks in. And I'm like, damn it, I'm so tired of seeing this card. But I think this is one that'll actually keep things interesting, even if it's played in every single deck, because it's it's not the, the Simic lock-in ramp where we not see Bant ramp every single time. You know, we saw the Selesnya, now we have this. We might actually see some, some like Naya ramp, some other colors getting to play some big mana spells and i'm kind of excited for that I, on the flip side though we do still have euro which is two lands in one turn and it's a three mana. An extra mana now yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just sort of plays beautifully with this so i'm not happy about that i gotta say the idea of like this and then euro and then off that euro you can get a, a another one of these like oh god but 
all the other stuff, like everything else, you know, take out competitive magic. And I'm super excited for this card. Super excited. Mm. And uh, so for me, competitive magic has become standard. <laughs> and historic has become uh, where I play all of my jank almost exclusively. It's, uh, it's a little bit more diverse. There's a little bit more craziness to it, right? Like the power levels definitely turned up. And it is hard to compete with the meta, but at the same time, um, just to have access to so many things. Like, this Cobra will still build in really well with Zendikar. But taking this Cobra into Historic, oh no, right? Like, that's huge repercussions. Like, oh, yeah. I guarantee you there's combos, like infinite combo. I'm not smart enough to do that <laughs> by any means, but this Lotus Cobra is 100% going infinite. I'm sure of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Next up, we have Amanamanamanath, Locus of Creation. And this, it's just Amnath, by the way. Um, it's four mana, red, green, white, and blue, so no black men in here. And then in the landfall effect, I think it's also just those four colors. So kind of cool because it's like the colors of a rainbow. You know, it's got that going on in the card. All right, anyways, whenever it enters the battlefield, draw a card. And this is going to be a 4 4, so four mana for a 4 4 that draws your card. That already is like, okay, sure. And then the landfall ability. This is bonkers, especially whenever we talk about things like Lotus Cobra and Marasa Root Grazer, which allows you to, you know, have extra benefits off this. So whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you gain four life because this is the first time the ability has resolved this turn. Cool beans. Four life for a land. If it's the second time, you get to add four mana. One of red, one green, one white, one blue. If it's the third time, Amanath deals four damage to each opponent and each planeswalker you don't control. So it's like a one-sided Storm's Wrath to their face and the planeswalkers. It doesn't hit creatures, but it's, that's crazy. Four mana for this card, and we just mentioned a card that allows you to easily get this down in almost any color you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> it's problematic. I like it's a legendary, right? So it's not gonna be too bad. And <laughs> well, I actually the fact that it replaces itself whenever a card enters the battlefield and draws immediately, this is a probably very good card because even if it suffers immediate removal, it's replaced itself. And uh, there's a chance for it to be a land, but there's a chance that it wasn't. Um and this is powerful because oh, if it gets removed immediately replace itself not so bad right don't mind that it stays in play oh no right so there's there's not that bad of a downside and you know going full circle when i was looking at elder gargaroth less set i was like well this is a bad card it doesn't do anything when it comes in play it's just going to get removed and then you've got to interact with it think of how much better omnath is going to be since it enters the battlefield and draws you a card and then if they choose not to deal with it, you can literally explode on your opponent. Maybe not so much if you don't have any um, playing multiple lands uh, per turn, but if you can get down uh, two lands on the turn that this was out, uh, so potentially if you play Uro for three after uh, Omnath is out, you're going to get four mana back, and you already had four, spent one, so you've got five mana, plus Omnath brings in a land for six, so it's like it can get out of control pretty quick and then we see you know maybe you have a lotus cobra in play that extra land pushes you to seven and now you're on ultimatum already right like stop it yeah so it's... i'm really looking forward to all of the janked up ramp because typically and now i know this is, might get annoying um and we'll just have to run counter magic right keep a couple negates or something um but like Typically, we don't cast seven CMC spells and higher, right? Like, these are pipe dreams, right? Game's over by the time you get there. But recently, we've been able to do that, uh, you know, like turn four sometimes. So it, it's really cool that you can explode. Um, but the downside to that is most of your creatures were ramp creatures. And if they do have some counter magic, you know, you've emptied your entire hand onto the board, used your payoff spell, and now you're top decking. Um, so if much reward comes much risk, right? Um, and I think Omnarth Locus of Creation is uh, really going to get us there. Yeah, it, it reminds me, I don't know if you watched much of Krogis whenever he was doing the Field of Dead decks, but he, he would run decks that had like 32 to 34 lands. And this is in a 60-card deck. 
I'm a little worried we might start seeing that with landfall, where it's just like, you know what, lands are so powerful, and thanks to things like, you know, uh, Valakut, Stoneforge, why not, right? There's there's no downside. So we went from yeah. people complaining about how, how poor lands were, to now this set, and everyone's going to be like, no more, please, no more lands. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Magic does do a really good job of that, typically, of balancing their mechanics. So maybe we can find some sort of uh, counter to all of these lands. Except we have Shepherd of Heroes for five. This is a 3-4 with flying. Angel Cleric, so the Cleric archetype there, uh, will fill out our adventure mechanic. Whenever Shepherd, Heroes, or Shepherd of Heroes enters the battlefield, you gain two life for each creature in your party. Your party consists of up to one cleric, rogue, warrior, and wizard. If we have all four in play, when Shepard enters, we're getting eight life, which is substantial, right? That's not bad. Uh, the card is a little expensive for five. Flying is nice. This overall, to me, is just a pretty good uh, limited pick if you've got white and you're trying the party mechanic. Yeah, I think it'll be good if, if again, and I go back to the free-to-play players, if you're free-to-play and aggro turns out to be just wrecking shit in standard i think this will be a safe bet for you because you can probably find a party within mono white i'm assuming they're going to give us enough tools for that to you know five mana have a flying creature that can swing in you gain some life back i, I feel like it'd be pretty good there uh next up we have act Acquisitions Expert. This is a two mana, another rogue, so we're getting a little bit more fuel for the fire with those. And it reads, whenever Acquisition Expert enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals a number of cards from their hand equal to the number of creatures in your party. You choose one of those cards, that player discards that card. So I had to reread this one like five times the first time I read it to get it right. So let's say you're you have a party of a rogue and a warrior and a wizard, so you have three people in your party, all right? And this one comes down, this makes the third. Then your opponent will select three cards, so if they have six cards in hand, they'll select three of them. More than likely, they're going to give you their shittiest three. And then you get to pick one and take that card. So it's a very interesting and strange mechanic, but it reminds me of the... Oh, I can't think of it. It's the four mana Demir card where you sort of play mind games with what you want to reveal and what you don't, like right? Add or something. Yeah, it reminds me of that. Yeah, I mean, it's a two drop, so you're probably not going to have a huge party right away. Um, it's a one, two, so nothing special. Yeah. You know, if you, if you play a one drop that consists of something in your party and then this is your two drop, they select two cards to show you. Yeah. I mean, you're probably... It's not a thought seize, right? But it's it's something you're still building out your field. And if like, it in itself isn't amazing, but if you can build around it, um, you know, with this new party mechanic um, and just packing in those synergies, right? Um, so this could, you know, be that two drop that leads you into that three drop that also uses um, the party mechanic, right? So now you've got two and that will be your third. So it's just... Uh, Nothing is ever too much, but uh, collectively, uh, it can all add up quite consistently, I think. So, um, yeah. you know, we've seen the cycle, right? That was, uh, or cycling in Ikoria, and we've seen mutate in Ikoria. Um, you know, these cards and mechanics don't often work uh, with other things really well. Cycling is better because of um, historic and those old cycling cards. But, um, you know, within standard, they're basically um, isolated to the own, their own set. So I think, uh, and again, speaking of free-to-play uh, individuals, I think um, you know there's going to be some really cool uh, free-to-play um, adventure or party decks uh, for them to play. So really excited for what that brings. And um, you know, when we looked at the mutate cards, none of them really seemed crazy either at first glance. Like Dire Bat, pretty cool for a destroy target creature, um, and then Sterics, but majority of them weren't super busted, but when you start adding all of those mutates together onto the Sterics, and even the Sterics by itself wasn't great, um, but we can, when you can take all of one mechanic and make the most out of it, that's where I think we get some really cool um, free-to-play decks. Yeah. Anywho, Azri Beacon of Unity. This is a 5-drop with one mana symbol, a 4-6, 
This spell costs one less to cast for each creature in your party. That's interesting, right? And we talked about um, these party cards leading into uh, like a cascading event that gets more powerful, similar to Mutate. This might just be an answer for that. It does have a lot of text on it here. So it seems to me that we can either pay two generic mana or an island, two generic mana or a swamp, two generic mana or um, you know a mountain, and two generic mana or a forest. Um, not three. It'll be two or one, right? So it's going to really motivate you to get um, you know those four colors in play. Five because you have to cast um, him himself as the white. Then look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal up to two cleric, rogue, warrior, wizards, and or ally cards from among them and put them into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. We talked about the difference between putting things in your hand and putting them in the battlefield. This could cost four. It could cost, you know, eight, potentially, which is, I don't know how you'd have only white mana, but I guess you could do that. <laughs> um... But again, looking through the top six, that's like, if you don't find something through the top six and you're being punished somehow, like, <laughs> so it's like collected company because, you know, this is instant speed. We can do this at any time, right? It doesn't tap it. So we still get the blocker. It's a four, six, so a decent body. And then we can, again, instant speed them to our hand. Not as good as the battlefield like company, but regardless, draw two for four six is not bad especially if you know we can get some high value clerics rogues wizards and warriors in the deck um so maybe people might shy away from this early on i think this is perfect addition um and i know it's a mythic but still for a free-to-play deck if you get it right like if you are building this um party free-to-play deck you have a beacon of unity you know he goes in there, right? Because if you can curve into this, um, like so it costs five. If you do a one drop, a two drop, a three drop, it costs three less, and then you should you should be able to play it immediately. Or even uh, if you do a one drop, a two drop, your third land you can play them, right? So you could play um, Beacon of Unity on turn three, correct? Right? By yep. playing a turn one rogue and a turn two cleric or something. So, yeah. um, you know card for three i think is very high value i would love to play a four six for three every day that's good never mind being able to refill our hand um as well at instant speed so yeah, you know yeah. i think the beacon of unity might be a little bit of a sleeper it's a lot to digest but when you get into how it will play out within your games i i could dig it, it seems weird the mana is really stringent right? like needing one of every color or having like so obviously, it's very good value to pay four, maybe not so hot to pay six and eight, uh, potentially. Yeah, I... Uh, just need some mana. I, I think it'd be pretty good in mono-white weenies. Just just make a mono-white weenie sort of... I guess a little party deck. You wouldn't even have to focus too hard in it as long as you make sure your one drop and two drop will guarantee this hits on three. Mm -hmm. But again, it if you're aiming for this to hit on three... Then you're you're fighting it with Basri, right? Basri Ketani Planeswalker, which is played in those. And if you're aiming to hit it on four, you're fighting with either Basri's Lieutenant or Elspeth. And I know those are popular picks in Mono White Aggro. So I, I want to say I want to play it. You know, three mana for a four six, like you said, that's crazy value. I just I want to see what else they offer Mono White. Mm -hmm. And the party uh, mechanic yeah. in general. Oh yeah. Um, as far as like commanders, I don't really think so. I think it does open it up, right? But I think um, there's probably far better commanders. Yeah. Moving us along, we got Spools of Adventure. Six mana for this instant speed. The spell costs one less to cast for each creature in your party. So again, max four. Uh, and then you get to gain three life and draw three cards. So if you do have one of every top in your party, <laughs> two mana, draw three, gain three life. That's crazy. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm a little worried about the whole party system. Like, what if, like, like we saw with, uh, not adventures, because adventures, everything was good. But what if it just ends up being sort of a shutdown thing and it ends up just being an Azorius control thing? Because this card seems great. 
buying three cards is good. Um, you know, especially at instant speed. <clears throat> Hold up your counter magic. You don't counter. Boom. It comes with these. Uh, nice draw. So what this makes me want to look for is flash, speed, clerics, rogues, and wizards, right? So you can be running that counter spell tempo shenanigans where, you know, we have the counter magic. If we don't counter, we play another party member, right? And we keep doing this, and then we've got spoils of adventure on the top end to keep refilling our hand if we don't counter uh, in that mid game, right? So this is a great card. It's an uncommon as well, you know, buying three cards, gaining three life for two. That warrants a rare. However, the fact that it just costs six organically, I think is, you know, that drawback. So unplayable unless you're reducing its cost. If you are reducing its cost, a very, very good card. I don't think there's much middle ground there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you either play into this card or you don't play this card at all. Yeah, next up we have uh, Lin Vala, Shield of the Seagate for three. This is Azorius color, so one generic, one planes, and one island. Three, three, with flying. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you have a full party, choose target non-land permanent and opponent controls. Until your next turn, it can't attack or block, and its activated abilities cannot be activated. You can also sacrifice it at instant speed, choosing hexproof or indestructible. Creatures you control gain that ability until end of turn. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Azorius Flyers is a contender just from the addition of this card. Now, typically, those cards are great. Oh no, Field Wipe. They got us. Not anymore. Now we just sack our 3 3. Everybody gains Indestructible. You're probably dead next turn. That's crazy. Target your Imperium Eagle with Eagle Target Removal. Uses all of his mana. No, 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 you don't. Um,. And that could be situational because if you don't have enough creatures to support the Eagles plus plus ability, then you know it might be better just to let it leave. But uh, you know, the hexproof is good. That indestructible is amazing. Um, again, hexproof protects you from single target removal. Indestructible will protect you from non-targeted removal. Uh, can't protect from non-targeted exile, no matter how hard you try. I'm pretty sure, uh, which is a bummer. So things like extinction event. And that's why they have drawbacks of choosing, you know, odd or even. So it's just not the most busted card in the world. Um, again, like this is really going to protect the Azorius Flyers deck, uh, you know, from the Shatters or the Storm's Wraths, whatever you see. This is going to be groovy. Yeah, it, it's also, um, <clears throat> I'm starting to see this Esper sort of party control deck work itself out. <laughs> that's what's worrying me a little bit. <laughs> I actually love that thought. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're on board. <laughs> the rest of us are scared though. Alright, next up we have uh I'm gonna I'm gonna do both these cards because they're just on the same card basically. We have Merc Water Pathway and Clear Water Pathway. And this is the new answer they're having for our lands, basically. You know, we said we were gonna need some correction after the shock lands left, and this is it. So it's basically the the dual card like hdg was talking about before except instead of it being you know an instant or sorcery or whatever on the other side it's another land so this one is for blue blacks so we have the demir color schemes coming back up for us it's pretty groovy so these are brand new lands never seen before uh within magic the gathering uh they're rare so get your wild cards ready <laughs> um you know they're great i don't mind it I think it really opens up some of those multicolor decks, right? Like those three, four, five color decks. Um, I liked the dual lands, right? I liked the shock lands. It's going to be sad to see them go. Uh, you know, having both a, a forest and a swamp play uh, is really cool. It's the land type that I really, really like. Um, again, this does not really matter so much in standard, so it's not so bad to see them leave because um, they're in historic. I like when lands are more than one land type. Um, the Triomes are a really good example of that. They're three different land types. And, uh, you know, there are different mechanics and cards uh, within the deck that utilize different land types. Um, Dread Presence for the uh, the land enter the swamp entering the battlefield, for example. But that's why I really like, um, you know, multiple type lands. Uh, these aren't any type lands. These are neither a swamp nor an island. It's just a land. Um, 
So there's a little bit of a drawback there. I know a lot of people were saying on the reveal, well, there's no drawbacks. Um, that is the drawback, the fact that it's not a type of land. Um, if I had Dread Presence and I was going to play Murkwater Pathway, the trigger, it wouldn't trigger because it's not a swamp. Um, it's just a black mana source. So I think it's really cool because we're fixing a lot of the mana. I'm sad not right now, but in the future, I think, because they're not the land type. Right now, we don't have check lands, right? So, you know, boohoo. If we did, I mean, we're still the Triumphs. We'll really help with that. Um, again, that's just my thought on uh, these lands, why they're good, and maybe why they're bad. Yeah, so next up, we just have uh, Grim Climb Pathway and Bright Climb Pathway. It's the Orzhov color ones. Um, and yeah, again, the exact same situation. Yeah, there, there's no need for us to dive in on these. And then we have uh, a Raw Sky Cave Hierophant, or Hierophant, however you want to pronounce it. Four mana for this 3 3 with lifelink. Whenever a uh, or another cleric you control dies, return target cleric card with lesser converted mana cost from your graveyard to the battlefield. So I'm not brushed up on all my clerics in standard, if I'm being completely honest, but it seems like off the top. Cool card, just fun for jank. Four mana though for this ability. Yeah, you probably won't see it too competitively. Well, I know Jeff had previously mentioned uh, in one of our other episodes that he had liked clerics quite a bit and he wanted a cleric trial. Does oh, this guy have an inside scoop? How did he know all these clerics were coming, right? <laughs> um, so oh, it is a cleric itself, so it's going to fill out your adventure party. Okay, not so bad, right? It could be your fourth member, which would be your fourth drop, right? So uh, that could be all right. And then if you were focused solely on the adventure, you're going to have multiple clerics in your deck. It doesn't mean that you need cleric tribal, right? But, you know, maybe five, eight clerics in your deck, maybe a few more, depends, um, is still enough to make sure that ability is like activating and triggering sometimes. Again, it's maybe not most powerful because with the adventure, um, or I keep calling it adventure, but with the party mechanic, um, you do need to kind of spread that out. You've got to have some rogues, some warriors, some clerics, and some wizards. So it's not like it's going to be, you know, continuously bringing things back from the grave. Um, it does have the potential to trigger. So I, maybe if it fills that role of your fourth party member uh, as a cleric maybe this is a one of or a two of an adventure deck i don't think it's anything that we really build around though um at least not myself anywho river glide pathway and lava glide pathway are are is it lands um these are actually really cool you're gonna have to check out the art for these uh you know either adding a blue mana source or a red mana source they are neither mountain nor island which is a bit of a bummer and we also have Branch Loft Pathway and Boulder Loft Pathway, and these will be um, our Selesnia lands. One of them is green, and the other is white. Nice. Um, let's see. Moving on from there, we have Cliff Haven Cell Sword, two mana for a three one. So just basically, uh, what what do we call these blades, right? Or blades. It's just, yeah. yeah. Just a solid attacker, cheap mana. Good, good for the mono white weenies deck I was talking about. And it's a warrior, so it fills out your party nicely, right? Yeah, it's a warrior. Yeah. We have Farsight Adept for three. This is a 3-3 three, three core wizard. So again, filling out your party. Mono white. This guy, he's on the inside loop too, apparently. <laughs> when Farsight Adept enters the battlefield, you and target opponent each draw a card. So you know, having your opponent draw is never great. It's better if Narset's on the field and then they don't get to draw. Um... You drawing a card is great. If it was a 3-3 and only you drew a card for three, I'd be all game. I think that's pretty good. The fact that you are also gaslighting your opponent kind of is a takeaway because what if that was the card they needed or it was the land on top that would have given you that extra turn to win and now that land's out of the way and then they drew that actual card that would like hit you or something. So it's a, it's a gamble. And if there's any way to you know either have a trigger that benefits you off of uh, the cards being drawn, both you or your opponent, whatever, then it could see play, right? And then you're utilizing just general advantage rules. But, you know, it's just a 3-3 three, three for 3. 
just like super vanilla, not great. Unless you're making sure your opponent can't draw or you're utilizing the draws for something else. Now you're muted, bro. Anyway, next up we have Mirfolk Wind Robber. This is a 1-1 <laughs> uh, with flying. Whenever Mirfolk Wind Robber deals damage to a player, that player mills a card. Sacrifice Mirfolk Wind Robber, draw a card, activate this ability only if an opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard. 1-1, one, one, flying for one. We lost the Sailor. This doesn't have flash, so that's a bummer. Sacrificing it to draw a card, um, you know, probably not great unless it gets to the point where your opponent has blockers and you know that you can get something else that's better. Um, or again, if you're utilizing draw effects to trigger something else, then sacrificing it for that draw could be really good, right? Um, and then, you know, just having your opponent mill cards whenever you deal combat damage. So shabby. Typically, Tempo Blue doesn't really mill their opponent, right? They kind of just, like, hit for damage, counter the spells, and close out the game four or five turns. So it's weird to see, um, you know, one drop fire in blue that is focused on mills. Not really. I mean, it makes sense, but... I was going to say, now, now that we have Teferi's Tutelage and that, that crab thing that we saw earlier, honestly, Teferi's Tutelage was enough to start annoying me now in Standard. But now we have another source of, like, <laughs> one, one mana continual mill, three mana continual mill, this thing is one mana continual mill. It's gonna it's gonna get annoying. I'm not saying it's gonna be competitive. Right? It gets quiet. <laughs> it's, it's gonna be annoying. <laughs> uh, next up yeah. we have. I, oh, go ahead. Does it take place of the zero four that has the adventure for mill for four, and then you can play it for the defender? Does it beat that, or does it just go side by side in conjunction? Yeah, you're right. Maybe maybe we see mono blue tempo mill. Maybe tempo changes from trying to deal damage, and they're like, no, never mind. I'm just gonna mill you. Yeah, I, okay. I can see it. Uh, next next up, I'm super excited about this card. By the way, we have Zareth Sun, uh, the Trickster, five mana for a four four with flash. So great stat line already, considering it has flash. And then for four mana, you can return. An unblocked attacking rogue you control to its owner's hand. Put Zareth's son, the trickster, from your hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. So you can play this. It, it's still flash speed. Mana cost by one. Yeah, you, you reduce the mana cost by one, but it's kind of like you play it at Ember Cleave speed if that helps people to, you know, side by side it. Um, anyway, so it's tapped and attacking, and it reads, whenever this card deals combat damage, which obviously if you're swapping it out for one that's unblocked, it's going to deal the combat damage to a player, you may put target permanent cards from that player's graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. So not exactly Agent of Treachery, because stuff has to be in the graveyard, right? But if you're milling your opponent, right, if you're in Demir and you're milling them with, you know, various tutelage, the Merfolk Wind Robber, whatever you're using... You're just going to pull their Yugen, right? You're just going to pull their biggest, baddest threat that you find. I'm loving it, yeah. and I'm hating it all in one. It's going to warrant instant speed removal. Right? You're going to want Heart's Desire, or not Heart's Desire, that's the Heartless Act. Um, just, you know, snipe this off the field, potentially. Yeah, but, but again, it... that, like you say, it is something that is coming down mid combat ember cleave speed since people are familiar with that you have to not bite the bullet you really need to push your priorities to the last second every time right Don't use your removal early once you know these are the t attacks those are the blocks hold the phone right wait it out and uh, try to juke them out into pulling it again um if you do try to wait it out they could just push to combat damage and uh allow it to go through so it's you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't <laughs> and then again you know just like playing your opponent's permanence stop it right yeah, it if there is fun. one way to have people concede within the arena it's playing one of their cards <laughs> especially one of their good cards um you know like doctor mentions you know milling that ugin or like having them 
discard their Ugin for some effect because they're like, wow, well, I've got more Ugins and I don't have to land yet. I'll throw this one away or I'll pull it with Elspeth Conqueror's Death later. Um, it's nice because typically Elspeth Conqueror's Death was worrisome. It's like Ugins in the grave, they've got access to white. When is ECD coming down? Now you could race them to their ECD and even beat them because ECD comes down as five, has to trigger, which is six, and then gets the permanent at seven, right? So if you can get this out a turn early for four or five or six, you can still get to their library or their graveyard and take out whatever they were going to go for anyways. And hopefully it was the only thing, and then their ECD will fizzle. Um, yeah, this is good in so many ways. Again, if you don't have attacking rogues, even flashing this down, that's fine. Yeah. Um, target permanent card like you said we could pull ugans you could pull enchantments you know it's not just creatures that's amazing um you could pull a land right <laughs> if you really wanted um yeah. like i said i see this esper party deck literally forming itself you know and so i mentioned earlier looking for these um party decks with flash there's one piece Anywho, next up, we have Nissa of Shadowed Bows for four. Uh, I believe this was the leaked version, but we're getting it officially here. It comes in with four loyalty, landfall as a static ability. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a loyalty counter on Nissa of the Shadow Bows. That's great, right? Coming in with four, you know, hopefully. So if you play it turn five, you play a land after. If you play it turn four, you're, you won't get that landfall trigger unless you're playing multiple lands, right? Because you'll obviously be on three lands, play to four, play her, tap all your lands. But if you can play multiple lands, um, it'll come in as four plus to five landfall to six, which is pretty cool, which will allow you to minus five next turn without killing it. Um, and then you may have a creature card with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of lands you control uh, onto the battlefield from your hand uh, to the graveyard with two plus one plus one counters on it. Again, you know, playing anything worth six mana is pretty buff. Like, uh, an Elder Gargaroth is only five. Um, you know, so pulling uh, Dream Trawler, well, maybe not in these colors. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's a lot of really cool things uh, that you could pull. Granos, potentially, as well, right? Um, so I think this Nissa is definitely going to see play um i know i'm probably going after this day one in the multiple lands just trying to cheat a big creature out uh almost immediately if they don't remove her after that first turn um again it's put a creature card with converted man cost uh less than so you get to search your library for whichever creature card you want it's not like look at the top six and then if you got one play that um no, no straight up just get it's from your hand or graveyard oh sorry 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 e senor Regardless, um, it's all right. Uh, maybe, obviously, not so good. No, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, put something out from your hand. Good, harder to draw it. Um, and then it's or is it uh, your hand or graveyard? So it's just your graveyard too. Okay. But the the other really Still, nice thing is, is thing. what's up? Like uh, go Gary self mill oh, is yeah. uh, am I feasible? Right. Yeah, and this also has the plus one ability of the old Nissa, where it can turn your lands into fightable creatures, which we saw was, it, it worked, you know? It wasn't necessarily the thing that's going to win you the matches, though it could. It's it's damaging to have a Planeswalker come down and have its effects and its abilities, and then also have a creature come out of that Planeswalker that can already attack off the bat. So for four mana, you can get a planeswalker that allows you to get benefits off of your landfall and you also get a 3-3 with ace and i like to untap the, a land <laughs> i like that the land leaves the battlefield um so it's not subject to the wipes that uh, can sometimes eat those decks up uh, so i like that part part i don't like is that there's no vigilance I, we used to be able to attack with our lands and then use the mana afterwards here we don't have that um you know we still have haste but we get menace instead so you're more aggro toward version right? using the attack always right yeah. um because if they have the blocker you still get to get around them without losing your land and you're not going to have a defender anyways um so i think that's 
really great for the balancing. It's almost like they took last Nissa and they're like, okay, still want Nissa. How do we reprint this card, but as a more acceptable power level? And, um, you know, it's not doubling, obviously, the amount of mana pool that you can use through your forest. But I still think that it's really fills that void quite nicely. Yeah, I, I'm excited to see Nissa returning. She was one that, uh, <clears throat> again, even outside of competitive magic, I enjoyed playing just for the, the jankiness, right? All that mana. Anyways, next up we have Spitfire Lagic, or Logic. I'm not quite sure. Four mana for this 3-4 with the landfall ability, and it reads whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, Spitfire deals one damage to each opponent. So for four mana, I don't... I don't see it really happening, of course. There will be kooky people like myself and Jeff and HGG that are playing this card and then trying to play down 20 lands in one turn because that's just how the <laughs> world works. But I, I may, maybe in limited, right? Yeah, even then. I yeah. mean, in limited, I guess it just has decent base stats, a 3-4 four, for 4. It can deal chip damage, which could be good. Limited matches kind of have that tendency where the, the walls build up and they go on quite a while um that's not bad anywho uh gnarled colony for two this is a two two beast creature kicker for three so coming down for five total potentially if gnarled con <laughs> uh if gnarled colony was kicked uh, it enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it each creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it will also have trample you know that's really nice there's not so many things. Um, like, I think Grum Gully is leaving. I don't know how many things uh, retroactively put plus one, plus ones uh, on your permanents always. So, mm, I think uh, it's a great limited card. I'm not sure that this is going to see uh, super standard play. Potentially in some free to play, just for the trample, right? Like, if we could get trample on all of our creatures for two. And just by default, have the creatures with plus one, plus one counters on them uh, as a deck type. Um, so that could be good. Uh, but again, we have Garrick's Uprising, which again gives everybody trample. They don't have to have a plus one, plus one on it. And it's a, a draw engine for us. Again, this is a two drop. That's a three drop or a four drop. So there is a difference there. I... Seems weird. Yeah. 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 It's just one of those. <laughs> yeah. Next up, we have uh, Might of Barasa. Two mana instant speed. Target creature gets plus three, plus three until end of turn. If the spell is kicked and its kicker costs three, so total five, um, that creature gets plus five, plus five until end of turn. Again, it'll be something you might play in limited. Maybe a free to play player like throws this in their weird, kooky, gruel aggro deck. But... Yeah, you'll definitely. I mean, yeah, it's a jank card for sure. Like, you have to double it somehow. Right? Oh, yeah, plus there 10, plus 10. There you go. <laughs> what I like is the art. That frog is deadly. That's a cool looking frog, dude. <laughs> uh, Grotog, bug catcher for two. This is a one, two. Goblin warrior with trample. Whenever Grotog, bug catcher attacks, it gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn for each creature in your party. Not so bad. I mean, this does kind of support uh, a more aggro uh, party build. Yeah, more, more just uh, generic fills, I think. Well, this is actually like the crazy thing about this card. So we were talking about the the swords earlier, right? And that was a three one. If you if you line the party system up right, come turn three when this thing's swinging in, it's a four two with trample for two mana. And it's only a common. Like, even... I'm a little worried, even for historic goblins. Like, goblins were already doing pretty good. I don't know the other... Oh, the goblin archetype is kind of messed up. Yeah, like, I don't know the, the side... You have goblin clerics and stuff, though? Party. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I don't know the side parties for all the goblins. I know you have goblin rogues, the ten and all of that. Yeah, and you have goblin wizards, so... It's just, it's crazy oh, it to is. think... Two mana for a four two with trample, like oof. And if it's getting the other anthem effects from the goblins, the plus one plus one. Oh uh, no. <laughs> That's a five three, baby. That uh, might actually survive. 
Uh, it's one of those common cards that I could definitely see people squeezing it in just for the efficiency of it, the damage. But we'll have to see how well the party system holds up, right? Next up, we have Expedition Diviner. Four mana for a Merfolk Wizard. And you're going to see a bunch of these, like, dual dual type creatures where it's like some some variant and then wizard warrior rogue cleric whatever so flying three two for four mana that's okay stat line if nothing else for limited as long as you control another wizard uh, expedition diviner has when this card dies draw a card so again probably a limited card uh maybe in a free to play flyers deck but other than that uh you know, it's it's not terrible value. It's just not stellar. Yeah, nothing we're attracted to. Next up, we have uh, Killer Verge Pathway, which is uh, a white land. And on the opposite side of it, we have a Needle Verge Pathway. And then that is a red source. So we have a Boros uh, land combination here, which is quite nice. Um, and then after that, Zelleport Duelist for one. It's a 1-1 one, one Human Rogue with Flash, right? Whenever it enters the battlefield, up to one target creature gets minus two, minus zero until end of turn. It controller mills two cards, okay? So we've got the adventure through the Rogue, right? Uh, when it enters the battlefield, it gets that effect. It can, you know, do combat tricks if your opponent's attacking you. It's a 3-1 and you've got a 2-1. Or 2-2, two, two, you can dump them down to one attack and get the block, which is pretty nice. You can even use them as the blocker, potentially, right? Uh, just to deal with their creature if you don't need your duelist to survive. And he has no other effects other than when they enter the battlefield. So, you know, if they are attacking with a 3-1, you throw this on the field, you nuke them down, 1-1. Uh, but even then, um, you would kill them anyways. I don't know. I think it's good. The the mill is cool. The rogue is cool. Minus two will save you combat. You probably don't want to use it for the defense, though, because if it only has one defense, you could have just organically killed it. Um, so if anything, maybe you flash it in. He has multiple attackers. You reduce the attack of one, and you use this as a flash blocker to kill the one that it could. That's probably the highest value for it. Then again, you might want to be stacking your rogues, clerics, uh, warriors, wizards for your party, so you might not necessarily want to just use it um, as that chump defender. Yeah. A common card uh, with you know a little bit of potential. Yeah, you always enjoy those commons that have have potential. At least I do. I'm always like, oh, the, these are the cards. Three weeks from now, I'm gonna come back and be like, all right, cool, let's make a deck with you, all right? Uh, next up, we have. Tajuru Paragon. We're just going to call him Paragon because I butchered that first name. Two mana, it's an elf, and it reads Tajuru Paragon is also a cleric, rogue, warrior, and wizard. So if you have this card down, you have a full party, is what I'm understanding, right? Because it's one of all the other cons. So for two mana, you can have a full party. That's, that's a little crazy. Um, anyways, kicker of three. And it reads, when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, reveal the top six cards of your library. You may put a card that shares a creature type with it from among them into your hand. Put the rest of the bottom of your library. Okay, so you basically get to dive into your deck and find another party member, right? And this is a 3-2 stat line for two mana. So good stat line, great type, because it, it is a whole party in one person. It's a one-man army, basically. And the kicker, which you'll be using late game, allows you to restock your hand. Yeah. It's got my tip of approval. Stamp, whatever. Thumbs up. <laughs> yep. So, like, we've seen... And I, I come full circle to this, like, that mutate archetype, which was really good, and then there were a few busted cards, like Gem Razor, within it. This is that. This just ties it all together, and it fits, and is not only fits, but is a must-have in uh, any party deck, as far as I'm concerned. It, it just immediately ignites you, and you've got a full party. You can get full effect from those spells. Like, you're looking at that uh, in three life, draw three cards for two if you have a full party. Buff. <laughs> hey, uh, that's really easy to get to all of a sudden, right? No longer do we have to play four creatures. It's down in one for two. We only need two more mana. 
and we're gaining life and drawing cards. Uh, and, you know, we could have potentially have counter magic on the backside of that, too. So we try to remove it. We protect it. If there's no removal, just feeling our hand. Um, yeah. yeah, woof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up, we have Cabria Outrider for four. It's a 3-3. Three, three, and when it enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. For each creature in your party, there's no haste um, on this creature. But it's a target creature, so you could potentially give it to someone else. Not bad. Three, three for four. Wouldn't typically play it. I think this is pretty ballin' for a party limited deck. Um, again, whenever I I don't like a card, I feel like I'd say, ah, oh, this is a limited card, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a common. It's one of those common. Warrior. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> Next up, we have Coveted Prize. Five mana for the sorcery speed spell. And it reads, this spell costs one less to cast for each creature in your party. So again, you play the paragon and boom. It immediately costs four less, so only one mana. Um, search your library for a card, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Well, that's great. If you have a full party, which again, with the paragon, you may cast a spell with converted mana cost four or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. So you could theoretically... Right, if you have turn one ramp, you could theoretically get down Paragon, play this on turn two, right? Am I am I wrong? The like turn yep. two Paragon be black mana is the only thing. Yeah, turn two Paragon into co coveted prize, and you can then play that spell that you went and grabbed. That's four CMC or less. Oh, the aggro, the, the potential. I don't even know. Like, I'm not even smart enough to fathom how deadly that's going to be. Right? You just need to find some cool stuff to pull out, bro. <laughs> yeah, like, that's a that's a turn two. You could have a paragon down with a demonic embrace on it, and now turn two, you have a 6-3 flying creature. What? <laughs> Talk about a blade. That's a that's a fucking that's a two handed sword. Yeah, it any spell as well, not just a creature card. Like yeah, just you may cast a spell. Oh. Wow. You now, get a, a lot of people might shy. But they're, it's good of them to push these cards out. Like you know, we just read one, and now yeah. two, three cards later, we're on this one. I, they definitely do that on purpose. I've noticed that to be a reoccurring theme. Um, which is a bummer because that means everybody's gonna go right to it. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, woof. Yeah, this is this that is. It's neat. a turn two Nissa. <laughs> <laughs> what? Stop it! Oh, I'm I'm grossed out by that, and also very excited. I can tell y'all right now, my first day on pre-release is gonna be like 25 coveted prize decks. <laughs> Oh, your, your turn two Nissa also makes a land to smash with. Yeah, oh God. <laughs> which brings you to your next turn, which could be a minus five potentially to cheat anything you want out from your hand. No. You could have turn three anything you want. Yeah, right. At creature, yeah. three any creature you want. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we got we have. Uh... Normally you can do, but normally you can't do that while yeah. having the planeswalker on the field and while having creatures like. I was about to say that's the turn three Gigantosaurus with all the with all the boost, all the benefits. <laughs> Holy shit! All right, <laughs> stop it. Uh. That makes the trample card better. What was that card that was like? Oh no, that needed plus one plus ones. Never mind. It'd still just be good with Garrick's Uprising though. Anywho, next up we've got the Timber Crown Pathway and Parage crown pathway <laughs> um and now this is the gold gary land one side of it is a green mana source and the other side is a red mana source and we have drana the last blood chief for five this is a legendary creature vampire cleric or four with flying never drana the last blood chief attacks defending player chooses a non-legendary creature card um in your graveyard you return that card to the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it a vampire in addition to its other types it costs five it won't be attacking right away there's no haste it does have evasion through flying which is nice then you're just gonna have a 
you're going to want to have a bunch of legendaries, um, you know, in your graveyard to be placed back on the battlefield. It seems like probably more of like uh, a vampire tribal brawl slash commander card, potentially. Um, you know, five drop is even maybe a little heavy for historic vampires. Like that's a pretty aggro style deck and there might be better five drops potentially, like even um, like Bona Butcher or whatever. Um, I think that's cheaper and, you know, in my opinion, a little bit better. I'd rather remove our opponent's permanents than bring our old ones back. Um, but yeah, cool card, mythic rare. I always like when, uh, you know, you get the mythic rare legendaries because it's like, well, I don't need four copies of it, right? Because I can't, like, I can only play one at a time. So, you know, this one copy that I pulled in my packs is probably just fine. And, um, you know, in the decks that I do think it fits in, the brawl decks, um, a vampire theme brawl deck um you know you only have one copy of that required anyway so you're bound to pull a copy of it eventually yeah there's no need to buy more of it yeah i, I mean if you if you like vampires and reanimates i think it's right up your alley but i do think like we had talked about in previous podcasts this is one of those cards that was printed for edh right uh next up we have confounding conundrum Two mana enchantment, and uh, we, we've been talking about, oh, landfall is so crazy, landfall is so crazy. And I know you've all been worried, and Wizards was too, so they printed this card. <laughs> Whenever it enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card, so that's nice. It immediately cycles itself, right? Beautiful. That's what every control player loves is value and efficiency, right? Whenever a land enters the battlefield under their opponent's control, if that player had another land enter the battlefield under their control this turn, they return a land they control to its owner's hand. So, two pieces. One, they're still getting all of the landfall effects, and in some cases, you're benefiting them because you're returning the land to their hand. So they're like, yeah, baby, play that, and I'm just going to keep playing my stuff back down. On the other hand, you're really fucking up ramp. So... <laughs> <laughs> like half of me's like yes this is the answer and the other half's like how do we deal with landfall but more than likely like i said you're playing this in control you're just gonna remove them you're just gonna uh heartless act the the little cobra that comes out and then you're gonna confound in conundrum right so the idea here i'm sure is to sort of juggle your opponent's stuff and keep it all into their hand right is good two mana draw a card you know we've seen cards that are just that right <laughs> never mind stopping your opponent's ramp um but this is great um i'm not sure lasvana or something um your opponent can't tap non-land permanence for mana um i don't know if that's leaving or not but you could potentially shut down um duo land drops and their mana dorks like uh, the gilded goose etc etc if their deck is predicated upon those strategies, uh, GG, RIP, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And then, you know, my next thought is like, okay, it might be bad with the landfall. But is landfall good if they can't ramp, right? If they can't get those first three, four, five lands down, is it really that good? Can right. we have those spare turns to now, you know, amass some control in our hand where there's counter spells or there's like, right, um, to gain a little bit more control? So. Right. Landfall is only good if you have a permanent that utilizes the landfall. Um, many of these permanents will cost, you know, not one or two mana. They might cost, um, well, that snake costs two mana. <laughs> the Cobra, that was Busto, though. Um, yeah, and then again, like, you know, maybe you just, because you can't get this down before all of the landfall, you know, maybe there's some bounce effects within your deck. And now, uh, if they did play the Cobra, you can bounce it back to their hand and then, you know, deal from it deal with it from there um so you know maybe not main deck unless it gets super toxic but i think definitely super duper sideboardable as long as you know, big brains don't just immediately have a play for it um you know grow spiral's gone thankfully from standard but could have been looking down the barrel of you know grow spiral quench you don't play your conundrum i grow spiral you play your conundrum i quench type scenario um it's nice that that's gone, I guess. <laughs> um, I think I'm very interested to see how, like, and that's, like, kind of my learning process as I'm, you know, around Magic the Gathering longer, more sets come out. 
that I'm actually like really involved with. It's not just like, oh, some new cards came out. It's like you're looking at all these cards and you're playing them for months, right? Um, so I like I put little like markers on cards that it's like, huh, that kind of confuses me. Like I'm not really 100% sure how to take that at value. Let's see how it does throughout the season and the year. This is one of those cards. The fact that it draws replaces itself you know, auto automatically makes it a good card, except for the fact that it's not instant speed. Right? That's the drawback there. But you get a huge plus of shutting down your opponent's ramp. Like, Uro is everywhere. How many times does Uro play an extra land? You know, it's for the first three times it's played probably, and maybe they don't play it you know, on turn eight when they already have 15 lands in play. But at that point, you don't need to shut down their multiple lands anyways. It's already too far gone. Um, but to put this down on turn two when your opponent's about to drop their Uro, yeah, they still get to do Uro stuff, draw their card, but ramp isn't there. It's not like you burned a card just to shut down their one land drop, right? It's like you burnt a card to shut down their one land drop and you replaced itself, plus it can shut it down in the rest of the game unless they address it with uh, like a Brazen Pour or a Destroyer or something, right? So founding Conundrum, um, both confounding and a conundrum for me i'm really uh <laughs> looking forward to see how it plays out yeah uh, Next up. another thing real quick it hits cultivate which is another thing that we've been seeing a crap ton of in standard because alongside euro everyone that doesn't have euro plays cultivate or beanstalk gen right the adventure spells so this shuts that down as well mm -hmm. it could be a lot of fun and uh, you know it is a two drop again, so it hits before cultivate. Yeah, which is sorry, that's what it's all about. Had to mention um, that. <laughs> I love that. So I love when there's like really good cards, and it's like, wow, this is a problem, and it's enough for the people to be yelling about it. I don't want to call anyone out, but uh, when you do get that public outrage, that's maybe not warranted. Um, the cries for bans. I would rather see, um, you know, people deal with it, learn how to sideboard against it, and then wizards address that. Right, and they're like, "Ooh, this was a good card." Everybody had to main board artifact destruction or whatever. Let's introduce some new cards in the next set that kind of tone that back. Yeah. And uh, you know, confounding conundrum, I feel like, is exactly that. Uh, it's a new card. I don't know if this. I don't think it's a reprint. Um, and it's going to shut down all of that old archetype that people have kind of been like a little bit upset with. So now there's much like Graf Digger's Cage, a protect all uh, from those specific kinds of decks. Next up, we have Wind Rider Wizard for three. It's a 2-2 two -two with flying. Human wizard, obviously. Whenever you cast an instant sorcery or wizard spell, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. This is going to be amazing and limited. If you can cycle your deck in limited to find those few bombs that you were able to pick, perfecto. Um, you know, probably not even that bad in some sort of wizard tribal jank. Again, I don't think ultra competitive. It cost two. I would say it was competitive. For three, you enter the battlefield effect. You'd have to cast a spell on top of it. And even then, it's just uh, like a cycle. It's not a hard draw. You're still having to toss something away. So I think pretty good and limited. Probably very good and limited. And, uh, you know, I don't think it'll see play in standard unless it's in some weird jank deck. Yeah. I'd have to agree, and unfortunately it won't be me playing that jank deck. I've never been real good with wizards. Next up, we have uh, Tajuru Blightblade. One mana for a 1-1 one, one with Death Touch. It's an elf rogue, so it fills out your party if you're uh, free to play it's player good. trying to play that. You know, it's a Death yeah. Touch. Yeah, it's, it's strictly solid. better than the other 1-1 one, one Death Touch. Yeah. Say it during the party mechanic, right? Yeah. The Green Snake. Cleric of Life's Bond for two... Vampire Cleric, it's a 2-2. Whenever another Cleric enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. Whenever you gain life for the first time each turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Cleric of Life's Bond. Interesting. This is Orzhov Colors. Costs one black, one planes, or one white. Is that Cleric? We've seen that other Cleric that brought other Clerics back from the grave, so we're filling out that Cleric archetype. Um, and it does help the party mechanic. I just don't think that it is uh incredible it's a vampire which is cool um again is vampire party gonna be an option can we make a party deck solely of vampires historic obviously but, uh, let's see how it fills out and that could be really cool 
Um, however, you know, I brought up, we've seen the, uh, the magic schedule for the year. Check that out if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, we're going back to Innistrad eventually uh, in the fourth quarter. So, you know, next year before rotation uh, with werewolves first and then vampires. So, you know, it's always nice to see these precursors kind of like sprinkled in that, uh, you know, might not be super relevant right now. But, uh, you know, in the future, they could increase in their power level as, you know, more tools are added to support them. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a toned down a Johnny, too, with the plus one, plus one counter. So I, I guess it's okay. <laughs> sad, though, that we haven't seen the yeah, cat. Yeah, only come one back. counter per turn. Yeah, yeah, just sad that we haven't so, seen okay. the exact equivalent. After, well, I think we've got a few more cards to go through. <laughs> Actually, no, just a few. Let's finish first, and then I want to talk about a Johnny for a second. All right. Legion Angel uh, for four, a four, three with flying. When it enters the battlefield, you may reveal a card. You own a named Legion Angel from outside the game, put it into your hand. So you could have a 4-3 with flying, and when you play it, you get to pull another copy from your sideboard. So some downsides to this. It's a great card, but it's not going to be consistent because you want at least one copy in your sideboard, probably two, right? So you have two main deck, two sideboard, or you have one main deck, three sideboard, and you bounce the spell. But cost four it's a four three with flying wouldn't you rather a white doesn't have a lot of card draw let's start there so anytime that you get to replace a spell or draw another spell is good within white so i think that's really good but i'm just not sure that it's enough right um and then the fact that you can't have the main deck you have to split them up to make it worthwhile it just seems weird see where i was seeing this card actually played more and again, maybe it's because I hate playing against them so much, but I always go to the control decks whenever I'm analyzing cards. And I'm like, how could they use this against me? And so what I'm seeing is, yeah, like you said, like one in the main board, three in the side. But what it allows, oh, it in a control matchup. Yeah, it allows for when there's that mirror. Now you got a body. Now you got two bodies. You know, you you got something to hit and hit hard with. It's kind of like. Uh, basilica bellhaunt whenever that was played in the control decks and it was like well you got this big body and it makes your opponent discard so I, you know it's sort of doing a little bit of everything this kind of it's not necessarily in the same boat but it's like you can play one card in your deck and if you hit a mirror match you got an answer that's actually great i i feel like you're you hit it spot on that this will probably find its way uh if we do see like some real control we'll call it not just the ramp control um but again, Ugin exists, so will he? <laughs> I guess you just counterspell. Um, but again, you're not using slots in your library, right? You don't need four angels. You don't want to draw it consistently. When you do get the match locked out, right? You've got your opponent uh, in the chokehold. Play your angel, and now you know you don't have to mill him to death. Or like uh, a good control deck only has one or two win cons, in my opinion. Um, two is obviously better in case they can deal with the first, like an ego or something. Um, very few win conditions and just lots of control, right? Lots of removal and draws. Well, and this would be great for that. Yeah, that's the nice thing about this card as well is like you're not going to be playing this down and then drawing your second copy out and then playing the second copy down. You're you're probably going to leave the first copy until they board wipe you or they deal with it, right? And then you'll play the second mm -hmm. copy after you. A second one yeah and then you get a third one right so you just sort of like Start keep out. a threat down which they're gonna love <laughs> yeah and i'm gonna hate because it's flying <laughs> uh next up we have palaka predation and palaka cavern so this is one of those lands that's also a spell um the double you know, you'll see you'll see you all see. Anyways, um, target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a card from it with converted mana cost three or greater. That player discards that card. And this is going to be the sorcery speed spell side of this double card shenanigans. And the other side uh, is just a simple... It's not a swamp, so I don't want to say that. But it's a simple land. It enters the battlefield tapped, and you can tap it to add one black mana. So it's essentially a swamp without being a swamp, right? So these are known as modal double-faced cards yeah i'll never <laughs> we do have an example for you guys to show you because um cards are double-faced right we used to have uh the back still be the back and then you get like the two tiny cards beside each other 
I don't know why they went away from it. I don't actually really mind that much because they were tiny and you had to like turn it sideways to read. Um, I think this is cool. I wanted to bring up the fact that uh, when it's in your library, you would see the uh, opposite side. And we have kind of like um, a new card to fill in its place. It's got uh, a couple white blank squares in which we can write uh, what our modal double face cards are. So we could write uh, Palaka Caverns and Palaka Predication on this white card that you have up on screen here as an example. Um, and that way, you still are drawing those two cards, but uh, it's not being revealed in your library while you shuffle or while it's sitting on the top of your library, right? Because you wouldn't want uh, your opponent and they don't want you to have that information as well, right? So uh, it's just a great way to keep full-size cards um, match everything else. Maybe there's another reason that they've done this. I'm not too sure. Yeah, I. we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Like you said, the... I feel like having two cards in one card is a cool concept, cool mechanic, whatever. But uh, I think the execution is what they're trying to f figure out, right? Um, so we did it. We made it all the way through the first set of spoilers. And I got to say, there were some ups, there were some downs. But it seemed, I don't want to say fair necessarily because we're still very early into the set. But they often do this where they drop a lot of the like interesting, here's the cool stuff right in the first day right to get you pumped to get you coming back for spoilers so we'll have to come back you know later and you'll have to come back later to see what's what the answers i guess that they're going to be dropping because they they never just give you a set and like here go have fun there's always like no no we're going to give you the answers it's your job to figure it out mm -hmm. um final thoughts i think the modal cards are very cool i'm really glad to be playing them in arena so i don't have to pull out my marker every time and just like you know scribble down uh so that's cool as always arena makes the play experience a lot friendlier uh new individuals like myself uh so that's awesome and uh as far as like power level goes nothing stands out and it's just like well, that's super duper busto except for um you know, what we mentioned earlier with the coveted prize and the Paragon combo, just try to push out anything. Um, lands are great. Having dual lands is amazing. And then, you know, better yet, having the lands that can be a land early game, you know, if you're flooding, it can be a spell later on. So it's really going to help, again, um, a new player experience, in my opinion. So they're not bricking on lands, they're not flooding on lands. It's just trying to reduce that maybe a little bit more. And then we see Nissa. She's busted. She goes in our combo uh, <laughs> that we were talking about with the Paragon. And, um, you know, the Trickster. I think the Trickster is probably the most busted uh, alongside the Cobra. The Cobra is really good. And the Seagate is really good. Maybe there are actually a lot of powerful cards in here now that I recap <laughs> for myself. And even Beacon of Unity, Omnarth. So I don't think we've seen anything super duper busto like as a single card. We've seen that combo that could work really good together. It hasn't necessarily been a questing beast though, or an Embercleave yet. Um, you know, even the Azorius Flyer is really cool, and the Confounding Conundrum is dope. But nothing that is like that card, like right. Um, so looking forward to seeing uh, what more is to come. I'm sure we'll get there, right? Yeah, one thing I always like to look at with the sets whenever they come out, um, and I guess this is more so because I'm a content creator, but also I feel like if I was just casually playing, I'd look at it, is the, the brewability with the set, right? And that's generally what gives us the longevity of being able to make multiple decks with different routes and all that. And what I'm enjoying with this set, just like I said with 2021, it it's looking high. It's looking like I'm going to be able to play, you know, a Selesnya version of the deck and then turn around and play an Azorius version that has similar cards, maybe similar party system even, but have a complete different feel to it. One may be Ramp and one may be Tempo Aggro, right? So I'm, I'm super excited to see the rest of the puzzle pieces, like you said, so we can see like how... How flexible are we actually going to be able to brew with the set, right? Because right now it seems super high. Yeah. Um, I just can't get over some of this land art, if I'm being honest. Like the uh, 
dual lands that are rare that tap for one single color. Oof. I yeah. see the gems leaving my account already. They're they're beautiful. Alrighty, um, I don't think I have anything else to add on this. I hope everybody's ready for Zendikar Rising. I'm I'm super pumped. Uh, HGG's got his dance going on there. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for watching, everybody. Make sure you check out uh, this podcast and previous versions of the podcast or episodes, I guess I should say, anywhere that you'd regularly uh, do so. And more importantly than that, share to a couple of your friends, right? Maybe have yourselves a, a listening party, get ready for Zendikar together and uh, all that jazz. Yep, thanks, everybody. Peace. Take care.